This last introduction gives me particular pleasure because the individual is not only esteemed as our other three uh, speakers are, he's also a personal friend. He has been called, I might add, among other things, the billionaire buccaneer for his flashy corporate takeovers in the last few years. In truth, Sir James Goldsmith might best be characterized as a reorganizer, though that title certainly doesn't to seem to suit his personality nearly so well as Buccaneer. Last year, for instance, he made a run at the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company. The takeover failed, though I find it difficult to label any business venture which makes $93 million in three weeks a failure. However, Sir James believes that his attempt forced Goodyear to restructure and reorganize until today, it is a much stronger company. And I would say that the stock market performance of the company vindicates his judgment. Other takeover bids have proven to be more successful if measured by obtaining complete control. He took over Crown Zellerback, the California Paper and Timber Company, and Diamond International, another major paper company. He gained control of the British food company Bovril in 1971, his first major acquisition, and two years later, the Grand Union food chain in the United States. He's a man of letters as well. He publishes the French weekly news magazine, L'Express. He divides his time between France, England, the United States, and Mexico. He is truly a citizen of the world. His corporate structure is made up of a network of Caribbean and Panamanian holding companies, and somehow it seems to me that this Caribbean association seems very appropriate for a former Eaton scholar, now termed business buccaneer, as the press portrays it. Ladies and gentlemen, the legendary Sir James Goldsmith. I'm very fortunate because I've been asked to talk about the world in the 90s, so I can't be proved wrong too quickly. I can remain very theoretical. There's no point in talking about specifics without understanding the general environment into which those specifics have to fit. The greatest business genius in the world if he'd stayed in Leningrad in 1917, then known as St. Petersburg, wouldn't look too good today. Whereas a very medium businessman in Houston or Los Angeles in 1917 would look pretty good today. So you have to get the general picture right. The big question is whether the changes we're living through now are changes within a certain continuity or whether we're facing discontinuities, whether we're facing really very fundamental changes as opposed to just evolutionary change. Um, Brzezinski wrote an excellent book called Game Plan, which I strongly recommend describes how Gromyko, the then Soviet foreign minister, used to sit in his room several times a week for several hours looking at maps and just trying to think strategically. And I've got a map, a first one somewhere, num number one. Here you have the map that we normally look at. But that's not the map he looked at. And I'd like to show you the map he looked at, which is the second slide, where, as you can see, the USSR is quite clearly in the center. And the trouble is that most of us constantly look at things only through our own eyes and forget the way our competitors, opponents, enemies, or indeed friends might be thinking. The best known example of this 
which I'm sure is the course the uh, the great battles that took great great wars that took place between Rome and the Phoenicians, in which the Phoenicians, like America, were mercantile people, merchants, and the Romans were imperial, and the Phoenicians could never understand how the Romans thought. They always kept on thinking, well, they can't want to do that because it doesn't make sense in our terms, commercial terms. But they can't want to build up their, their, their military strength to this degree. It doesn't make sense commercially. So the Phoenicians were always, in fact, uh, aiming at lower levels of armament, for example. Well, the Phoenicians finally got wiped out because they never understood that Romans looked at things imperially and didn't look at things as merchants. And there's many who draw a parallel now between the Western world, who look like Carthage or the Phoenicians, and the Soviet world that looks like, like Rome. So I think we have to start and look at all these things from different perspectives. And that's what I'm going to try and do when we come and look at the 1990s. First, let's start with the economy. The 1920s saw a major shift Great Britain, which had had economic supremacy, lost it after the First World War and transferred economic supremacy to America, who accepted it. America wasn't keen for it. It didn't lust for it. It accepted it, and accepted it with, with considerable sense of responsibility. It was a transfer within the similar culture between cousins to some degree, and yet it was nonetheless a difficult transfer, and some people think it contributed to the Great Depression. Now, obviously, one of the questions we must ask ourselves today is whether or not we are currently undergoing a similar transfer from America to Japan, whether economic supremacy is moving to Japan, who might be more anxious to take it than America was in the 20s, but clearly would be a more abrupt and decisive shift because it would be a shift away from our culture to a new one. So let's just look at a few slides. If I could have slide three. There you have the world's 10 largest companies in terms of market capitalization as of March the 31st, 1988. And you can see that of those 10, nine are Japanese. Only one is American. There's no European. IBM, 64 billion which is relatively small compared to Nippon Telephone of 301 billion. So nine out of 10 of the largest market capitalized companies are now Japanese. Now I'd like to look at banks. Um, these were the world's 10 largest banks in 1908. And in 1908, Britain was the dominant imperial force. And as you can see, number one was British, number f four was British, five was British, seven was British, eight was British, and ten was British. So there was a large British contingent which reflected Britain's place in the world. That was 1908. Now let's jump to 1970. In 1970, in the largest banks, you can see America was the dominant factor. Bank of America, Citibank, Chase Manhattan, Manny Hanny. J.P. Morgan, Western, Western Bank Corporation. That was 1970 when America was clearly the dominant economic factor, had economic supremacy, was the banker to the world. Now let's move on to 1986. There they are, the top seven Japanese. Daishi, Fuji, Sumitomo, Mitsubishi, Sanwe, no Inchukin, I can't pronounce these things, Industrial Bank of Japan. Then you have a French company, one American, Citibank, 10. So you have a really major shift in industrial terms and in banking terms. Now let's look, before we turn to this, and explain what the next chart is. The next chart is taking the markets, the stock markets, the securities markets of the world and calling those the world market capitalization and looking at market shares. Perhaps we could have the next chart. On the left, you have the US one in, 19, in the 1982 one, where the US had 54%, dropped to 29. Japan had 17%, it's gone to 44, nearly 45, which shows that Japan now, market value is over 50% greater 
than that of the United States. So something's happened. It's important. Is it irreversible? Then the next area to look at, of course, is military. Has there been a similar shift in, economic, in military supremacy as there has in economic supremacy? Uh, the other day I was watching Nixon promoting his book on, uh, on television, and he made an interesting point. He was talking about Soviet intervention in the Middle East. And he said on three occasions they tried to go into the Middle East, and at each of those occasions, American forces were put in nuclear alert. The first were in 1956 and 1958 under Eisenhower, and American military supremacy was absolute. There was no question they pulled back. Next time they went on military alert was in 1973 under Nixon. There again, American had what he called significant superiority, but not overwhelming. It still worked. He said it won't, the position has changed. In his view, that superiority is now very much open to doubt. The US could no longer behave, intervene in the same way. And many experts, as you know, feel that there's been a shift in balance and that the Soviets now have uh, nuclear superiority, military superiority. In Europe, after the INF agreement, they will, of course, have overwhelming advantage in every field, nuclear, conventional, and chemical. So these are big, seismic shifts, massive economic shift to Japan economically, major shift in military power towards the Soviets over the last 20, 30 years. And what uh, are going to be the effects of these seismic shifts? Now, I'd like you to think of yourselves a bit at this moment as Soviet leaders. If you were in Russia, you would know that you were not a mercantile, an industrial, a commercial culture. You would know that in today's changing world, and sitting next to you, sir, Mr. Scully, who knows more than anything how quickly things are changing, in today's changing world, you can only be competitive if you innovate and you can only innovate if you have freedom, individual freedom, economic freedom, decentralization. But the problem for the Soviets is that if you have those freedoms, their political system is destroyed. Their whole system is based on the antithesis of those freedoms. So they cannot create a change sufficiently deep to create the freedoms that are needed to be competitive without self-destructing. Even Gorbachev's economic mentor, Mr. Abel Aganbegian, states that it would take 20 or 30 years for the most fundamental changes that some people are talking about to deeply affect the Soviet economy. So the Soviets are condemned to build on their strengths and not on their weaknesses. And their strength is military. And any logical man sitting there in Moscow today would know that. Now, how can they do it? How can they get economic strength before major problems hit them or their empire decomposes? How can they do it fast enough? It's not by having a war. It's not by invading Europe. Because, first of that would destroy the very economic apparatus they would need. And they know that if they totally subjugate a nation, as they did after the war in Hungary and Czechoslovakia, they destroy the capacity to be competitive. So that's not the way to do it, but they've only got a window. Ultimately, their society will decompose. So they've got to move. And I believe that what they will try and do is entice Western Europe into an alliance. And that will do pretty well on continental Europe, not too well in Britain. It won't play well there. To do that, they've got to do the following. They've got to decouple 
Europe from America. Split them. And to do this, they will, in my forecast, within relatively short period, very early 1990s, there will be a major meeting in Berlin. Soviet leader, US leader, the two Germanys. The Soviet leader will announce that the Berlin Wall will be pulled down. He will announce the withdrawal from Eastern Europe of Russian troops, of Eastern Germany, Prussia, of Russian troops. The American president will announce a corresponding withdrawal of US troops from Western Europe, Western Germany. Symmetry, the great word of the day. Double zero option, another form of it. At the same time, they will announce that conversations will begin to reunify East and West Germany. Those conversations, by the way, will be purposefully protracted. Now, for those who like to look at the surface and don't want to look under the surface, that's going to be really good news. Peaceful coexistence, symmetry, double zeros, withdrawal of troops. Everybody's going to love it. But I'd like you to just consider one or two facts. Firstly, for the US to return, it will take a major political act and taking it through Congress. Chances of that will be pretty slim. For the Soviets to return, will take a few airplanes. Secondly, Europe will have been de decoupled from America militarily, and Germany will have been effectively neutralized during these purposefully protracted talks. And without German participation, there is no way in which Europe can mount a credible defense system. Europeans will also welcome it. They'll talk about uh, all this being the demonstration of peaceful coexistence, glasnost, perestroika, and all the rest of it, because that's what they'll want to believe. People are only bluffed when they want to be bluffed. And the reason why they'll want to, let's look at it from the European perspective, is that Europe is the first victim of the fall in the value of the US dollar. Europe is, a, the continental Europe particularly, Great Britain has been that way, but is pulling out to some degree now. European industry is rigid, ossified. And those frailties in European industry could be hidden for so long as America was irrigating the world was a massive trade deficit. The day America stops, it's not happened yet, but the day it does stop, uh, then Europe will take a triple whammy. First, it won't be able to export to America because of the di difference in value of the dollar. Secondly, American industry will start to be able to export more to Europe. And thirdly, Japan and the other Pacific countries, the NICs, Will, who will want to maintain their market shares in America, and to do so will have to drop their margins substantially to compensate for the drop in the dollar, will be therefore not making as much money. And to compensate for that, they're going to zero in on Europe, considering it the soft underbelly of the world economy, where they can go out and get their margins back. That could create a major recession in Europe. So Europe will look around, It'll have a recession. It'll look out to the east and see this major economic shift. It'll look to American pullback of troops. It'll think about rearming, but it won't do it. It won't do it for two reasons. Firstly, if there's an economic uh, recession there, they won't have the money to rearm at that time to create a credible defense. And also, when you grow accustomed to protection, you grow accustomed to it. And sheltering under the American nuclear umbrella has allowed Europeans to grow accustomed to it. So when they lose confidence in one protector, they will tend to look for another. This hostile world will not just be economic from the East, withdrawal by America, militarily. 
recession within Europe and enticement by the Soviets, but they'll also see Japan, who have a mirror image problem to that of the Soviets. Whereas the Soviets have got to convert military supremacy into economic strength, the Japanese have to convert economic supremacy into military strength. And we all know that theoretically the Japanese spend 1% of their GNP on defense, 1.01, that great symbolic act of going through the 1%. But I, nonetheless, I, I question its significance. Now, a quote from The Economist of a few weeks ago, which says, defense spending measured in dollars will be higher in Japan in the fiscal year starting in April of this year than in any other nation except America and Russia. The current program expires in 1990. Its successor will raise spending on defense considerably. There's no doubt in my mind that the Japanese could be tempted to try and leapfrog our technology, Western technology, in military matters as well. The Europeans will also look to America. And what will they see there? They'll see a country deeply divided, particularly on, on foreign policy. I mean, you all remember Harry Truman's statement, the US has become great because we are people who have been able to work together for greater objectives. I think the divisions now are, are deeper. I don't see as evident a consensus on foreign policy in this country. So a nation that's questioning its own fundamental values could look like a nation that could be tempted to withdraw into isolationism. It's certainly difficult to have a world vision and an effective world role in a free democracy without a consensus. Also, the Europeans, when they look to America, will look at the Ickley Report. I don't know if you've seen the Ickley Report. Just before he retired, it was published in the Pentagon, which clearly laid out America's priorities, defense priorities, uh, in the years to come. And there's no mincing of words. The defense of Western Europe is no longer a US military priority. So against this background, the Soviets will propose the creation of a new Europe. They will say our markets in the East, they'll say this to Western Europe, are a natural for you. No competition from Japan. They're yours. You can be the Japan in our market. They'll say, let's create a protected market from the Atlantic to the Urals, a marketplace of 780 million people. That's what it would be, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, and the Soviet bloc, the greatest in the world. Let's protect it with thick protectionist barriers. Let it be a European marketplace for European people, a community with a common European heritage. That'll be very tempting to Europeans, very tempting indeed. The Soviets would bring, the West, I'm sorry, Western Europe would bring economic infrastructure. Soviets would bring military supremacy. It would unite military power with economic strength. Well, just to show that this isn't fanciful, I want to quote from Gorbachev's book recently published, Perestroika. This is what he says as he lays the bait. Europe, he writes, is our common home. It is only together, collectively, and by following the sensible norms of coexistence that the Europeans can save their home and protect it. The idea of a common European home finds understanding among political and public figures, it's still Gorbachev, not only Eastern but also Western European. Thus, Foreign Minister Genscher of Federal Germany has declared a readiness to accept the concept of a common European home and to work together with the Soviet Union so as to make it a really common home. Other leaders have spoken to me in the same vein. It's perfectly clear what he's aiming at. And look how Western Europe is already starting to accept the bait. On French television, as you know, there have just been French presidential elections. 
And the other day, former President Giscard d'Estaing was on television. And a trendy European businessman called the Benedetti was on television with him. He's Italian. And this trendy got up and said, wouldn't it be wonderful if Western Europe had a Marshall program, a Marshall plan for this Eastern Europe? And Giscard d'Estaing said, yeah, great idea. He's also trendy. And uh, the leading newspaper in France, Le Monde, headlined in its editorial, let's expand Europe to the east, taking the bait. So now let's look at it from the US. The US will hail the destruction of the Berlin Wall, the withdrawal of troops, as another move to peace. Glasnost, Perestroika. Why? Because the US wants to. Each time this Europe, the Soviets will pull out of marginal areas in the world, which they have taken through previous waves of expansionism and which have turned out wrong for them. Afghanistan is one. Angola might be another. Each time they do that, it'll be hailed as another move to peace, even though in reality, it'll be focusing on their core, on their primary strategy. There'll be great waves of enthusiasm, also because the US will have a massive reduction in the cost of NATO. It's perfectly reasonable to welcome that, but it's going to be a factor as well. However, building protectionist barriers around these 780 million people will be interpreted in the US as a hostile economic act, particularly at a time when the relationship between the US and Japan will be strained. So in the US, there will be a major temptation to pull back and create a Northern American, North American common market. First steps were taken recently with a signature with Canada, some conversations with Mexico. US and Canada, for sure. Mexico progressively, not because either you or Mexico like it, because you can't help it, because a political or economic explosion in Mexico would transform the demographics of this country. So progressively, you'll have a North American common market 350 million people, one third of the world's GNP, quite comfortable for the short term. Now, that's the negative scenario. I believe in concentrating on the negative ones, but good things look after themselves. And it's not inevitable. You know, the current fashion at the moment, you see it in the bestsellers list and everything else, is that a nation's greatness depends on its material wealth. That's nonsense. Even recently, who were the major beneficiaries of the oil boom? Got hundreds of billions from wealth. What were they, Mexico, Nigeria, Iran? What did those hundreds and hundreds of billions supply? Supplied the opportunity to consolidate their problems. So it's not material wealth that creates greatness. It's will pride, principles, and needs a leader who incarnates those principles and galvanizes the people of his nation to act in accordance with them. And recent history proves this over and over again. In 1958, France, it looked like civil war breakdown, chaos. De Gaulle came. He was no economist. He just gave to France the most important thing of all, pride. And, he can't, and the economy prospered afterwards. In the late 1970s in Britain, it looked like a terminal breakdown. Thatcher came in and alone, against the bulk of a government, turned the nation around. And you can feel pride and prosperity returning. It was an English historian, Thomas Carlyle, who said, history is the plaything of individuals. So now, only strong leadership in America and Europe, with an unerring sense of mission, will be able to maintain a Western alliance of free and independent nations. The alternative is the emergence of two new superpowers, Japan's Pacific and the Soviet protectorate of Europe, continental Europe. And America will look inwards in a common market without a geopolitical role of significance. And in my view, the world will be 
a sadder and infinitely more dangerous place. Thank you very much. The second question, insofar as the, uh, the Knicks are concerned, there's no doubt that the Knicks are a major and developing area, and there's little doubt that the Japanese are re-establishing uh, what they call their zone of co-prosperity, I think is the word, the, the, the word of art they're all talking, the co-prosperity zone. What does that mean? The Japanese did not think of industry as having as its prime purpose employment whereas the Europeans thought that employment was the prime purpose of industry. Now, what happens if you think that the prime purpose of industry is to be effective and competitive, and the byproduct is employment, rather than the other way around? Let's just analyze that. What the Japanese did was when they had highly, high labor-intensive goods with a fairly cheap labor involved, they would farm those out to other countries and upgrade the use of their labor to the higher margin, more highly skilled uh, functions. That's true almost everywhere except in agriculture, where they felt it was a necessary stabilizer to their social structure. The result of that is fundamental in many respects. Firstly, from Japan's point of view, high labor-intensive items, which had been farmed out to cheaper places, could, benefit, could be a benefit for them when their currency went up, because it's exactly like importing a raw material. They were paying in highly valued yen, and therefore it was costing less. So it did not mean that they, it allowed them to be more competitive more quickly with the follow, falling of the dollar, because the rising of the yen allowed them to buy those high int labor intensive things more cheaply, just like they buy their oil more cheaply, their copper more cheaply, their lumber more cheaply. Europeans have the degenerate idea degenerate in economic terms, that l employment was the prime product and not the byproduct. And it was, why was it degenerate? It's degenerate because when you do that, it's rightfully good, it's a quick fix. You can protect your employment for a short period of time, but fairly quickly afterwards, you become non-competitive because you've got the wrong jobs and you've got ossified industry. And then your employment falls off like, or like, like falling off the side of a cliff. So all you've done is had a quick fix, as opposed to dealing with the fundament of the problem. So therefore, the whole of the Japanese co-prosperity zone has come about not only because of the uh, impetus of the Knicks themselves, the newly industrializing countries, but also because the Japanese have been farming out as they themselves have pulled up. This is typical in Thailand today, which I was hearing about a few days ago. And uh, so, you, you, so that the whole zone gets pulled out by this policy with Japan leading, constantly upgrading its function. Insofar as oil is concerned, who can really forecast what's going to happen in the Middle East with those wars? I certainly can't. The moment there's clearly a glut, at, that, at the moment price stability, relative price stability, and it's very relative because it's $17 today, but in a basket of currencies, that's only about 10 or $11, so it's fallen a lot, much more than you here in this room remember because it's in dollars. Uh, but for the Japanese, it's 50% further down. And that's only being held up by a cartel agreement, which will probably hold up as long as there's not major war there. And it looks at the moment as though it'll take about five years before the fundamentals start eating into that cartel. But having said that, one last word. I have behind my desk in the house I use in New York a document prepared in 1974-75 by MIT, uh, Dr. Wilson, Mr. Thoreau probably knows him, uh, who got together the leading scientists, economists, and industrialists on energy in the world and produced his forecasts, or their forecasts, for energy consumption to the year 2000 from 1974-75. And I look at it regularly, because it's humbling, because every single forecast is exactly wrong.
as I said during my, uh, my talk just now, what I was describing was the bad scenario. It can be changed. I hope it will be changed. I also questioned whether the transfer, which you could see from these charts to Japan, was irreversible or not. I don't think it is irreversible. The only people who can reverse it are you as individuals in the States. I don't think we can in Europe. The, one of the reasons why there's hope in these new areas of, of major research, and I was talking about it to my neighbor, Mr. Scully, just now during lunch, who I think agreed with me, uh, is that there are certain forms of research which benefit from massive amounts of money, huge organizations, can even be taken up by the state or large bureaucratic organizations. But there are certain types of research which are essentially individualistic, and depend entirely on the initiative, freedom, motivation of individuals. And Mr. Scully, I don't want, I don't want to miss quote you, but you were really saying, as I understood it, that software fell in the second category and hardware in the further category in your field, which demonstrated exactly that. Now, those parts of research which depend from that second category will be America's, should be America's, because you are archetypally the society which depends on the freedom of the individual and the motivation of the individual, whereas the Japanese have produced some new type of society, which I don't pretend to understand, which is collective capitalism. We've known collective socialism. They've got collective capitalism. It's strong, it's powerful, but it's limited in certain areas, such as the ones you've just mentioned. Now, I don't discount I don't eliminate the possibility. I am absolutely convinced that the Soviets want to win without a conflict. So will we all. I know that I'm doing the very mistake that I was warning against doing, is putting, looking at them through our eyes. But just if they, they have got to convert military strength into economic strength, they've got to. If not their own position with their satellites in Eastern Europe, even within Soviet Russia, where only 50% of the population is Russian and the rest is ethnically different, they, it's going to become a great problem to them. So they've got to do it. And they're not going to do it by destroying other people's in industry. They're going to do it by enticing them and trapping them. And that's the whole purpose. Now, therefore, they don't want it. I'm convinced of that. But on the other hand, these things can happen by mistake. Uh, you can have a nuclear war in the Middle East. You could have a situation whereby the balance gets so bad because everybody here has been screaming against SDI and, and ABM development. The Soviets have been developing ABM systems for their military uh, bases for years. I've seen photos of the, tele of the, of the, of the, of the, of the equipment of the uh, radar systems they've put up. So if you give them not only an aggressive capacity to beat, to win, but also a defensive one, so you haven't got a second strike. And in any case, they can defend against the second strike. You're getting into a perilous decision, position, because what creates war is not mutual strength, it's unilateral strength. And the weakness that one sees in the debate here on this is very frightening. But I don't think it's their prime purpose to win by military, the use of military power. I think it's to, to, we're doing it by having the military power. Thank, thanks very much.